What's going on, Mountie and U.S. History Kids? Mr. Tomei here. Got another video coming your way. Today we're going to talk about the Prohibition, uh, Prohibition and the Harlem Renaissance, uh, going on in the 1920s. And um, there'll be video questions that correspond, so make sure you're paying attention and uh, focused in. So let's go ahead and do this. So kind of leading off, uh, picking up where we left off, uh, we started talking about how women really started gaining a lot more power um, and there's a little bit slightly better uh, balance of gender equality in America going into the 1920s. A lot of this is obviously with the passing of the 19th Amendment, um, women getting the right to vote. Um, but uh, with that, uh, women began campaigning um, to in different areas, but in one specific area was this uh, concept of prohibition. Um, you know, alcohol uh, was believed to be the root of a lot of these social problems. And a lot of these problems resulted in some types of violence and oftentimes violence against women. Um, you know, prohibition pretty much was all about, hey, if we get rid of alcohol, we're going to have like, you know, less problems and we're going to have less violence at home and we're going to have more stable men. Therefore, you know, more of a stable lifestyle. And you see this picture, right? Lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours, right? It's a, uh, in that time, right? Saying we will not interact with men who are drinking, right? And so, you know, we see you know, protecting the babies, right? Um, it shows, you know, weekly children, you know, it shows, uh, you know, it's safer for babies with parents who don't drink versus drinking parents, um, you know, help to keep him pure. It's like save the mothers, save the children. And so this really kind of got a big, a lot of the traditionalists at the time supported it. Um, and as a result, we got the 18th Amendment, which uh, prohibited, uh, which is also known as prohibition. Uh, and this lasted from 1920 to 1933, and it banned the sale of all alcohol can, uh, and uh, ugh, alcohol and all consumption in that time period. Um, women played a huge role in getting prohibition passed as a law. Uh, but unfortunately, it actually brought a lot of negative side effects more than real effects. Um, crime actually went up because now, without the legal sale of alcohol, there was now an opportunity for the illegal sale of alcohol, which only contributed to other types of organized crime behavior. So the mafia, racketeering, uh, gambling, things of that nature at the time that were very taboo. And so prohibition outlawed alcohol in the 20s. Today in the United States, a parallel to try and tie it in is that only a few states allow marijuana to be used rec uh, recreationally. Um, although this is continually changing, that, it, it, the list is often growing and growing. So, you know, you see states more out here on the West Coast, for example, California, Oregon, Washington, which are very weed friendly. I think it was like four or five years ago that recreational marijuana use was com completely okay out here in California. Some states just straight up say, no, you can't even do it. These are typically more conservative states. Um, so again, right, uh, the modernist places, the progressive places, okay, allow for marijuana use, more conservative places, right? traditionalist places, they say no. Um, you're actually going to see in the homework, Oregon takes it to a whole nother level beyond marijuana use. Um, so again, across this time, the government really tried to crack down. They made over 500,000 uh, arrests during the 20s, all kind of around the sale and transportation of alcohol. Um, however, though, the government's attempt at enforcing prohibition did not prevent people from breaking the law. Oftentimes what would happen is on the low, you'd have things like speakeasies, 
Speakeasies were illegal secret bars that sold alcohol. They often, you know, served as strip clubs. They often served as a source of gambling. They were often supported and regulated by the mob. Again, illegal activity being created because of the banning of the sale of alcohol. Um, the term speakeasy is coming from, you know, speak easy to be chill, be cool, be cool, speak easy about it, right? They were typically kind of hole in the wall places, kind of random. You wouldn't think they were a bar. You'd have to say a code. If we were in class, we'd have a whole activity on this. It was pretty cool. The other part of that is bootlegging. Uh, you probably maybe have heard the term of like, oh, that's a bootleg pair of Jordans. Oh, that's the bootleg iPhone. Um, bootlegging is meaning like um, inferior or like home produced or something like that. Um, but back in the day, uh, bootlegging kind of referred to illegal producing of alcohol. So it's like people would make their own alcohol. They were bootlegging or bootleggers, right? If Mr. Tomei decided to make his own pair of like Jordans, they would be bootleg Jordans, right? Because I'm making it. And obviously, again, as I've alluded to, with, um, with the, the banning of the sale of alcohol, uh, there were individuals and groups who saw this as an opportunity. And so this was really birth of the gangster and organized crime. So you had big, uh, um, figures like Johnny Torrio, Bugs Moran, Al Capone is probably the most famous you would know. They grew to power and infamy during this prohibition period. So their gangs used bribery, um, union racketeering. They would uh, bribe government officials to get away with murder, illegal brothels, uh, the bootlegging of alcohol, and all sorts of different types of um, things that existed, um, uh, you know, in illegal affairs at the time. Uh, cities like New York, New Orleans, Philadelphia, LA, Atlantic City, uh, and mainly Chicago were kind of the epicenter, so the urban centers. Uh, for criminal activity uh, during this time period. And of course, the biggest gangster of them all is me. That was me as a young hooligan. Fire. Um, fun fact for all one NASCAR fans in my classes. Um, so you probably heard of NASCAR. It's the cars that go around a circle, but NASCAR actually has its roots in bootlegging. Um, so bootleggers in the South would race from destination to destination to avoid police and then deliver alcohol in time. Eventually these bootleggers began racing each other. And then eventually this led to the formation of NASCAR. So NASCAR roots all the way back to prohibition. Kind of wild. And then this is where I'd normally show you a bunch of videos in class, but we just don't have time for that. So surprisingly, even today, they're actually still dry counties. They're listed here in red. Uh, that's where alcohol sale is prohibited um, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so you see, again, definitely across the South is there a heavy presence of dry counties. And then there's also kind of mixed counties, which are in yellow, again, across the South, um, even actually up in the Midwest where there's certain rules like alcohol can only be served at certain times, not on Sundays and so on and so forth. Um, and again, a lot of this is carryover from older traditional values, conservative values. Um, just figured I'd show you that map. And then this, in the grand scheme of things, another group of people that were really behind this, uh, this was like the temperance movement. That was, a, it was a social movement against the consumption of alcohol beverages. So the promoting of full abstinence and promoting just modest way of life. So, you know, pretty much trying to be as square as possible, straight edge society. Um, uh, women were the big leaders of this movement, um, but also a lot of religious groups kind of backed the temperance movement as well. Um, there's actually still temperance groups today, including the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which, you know, wants to have traditional values. Again, we see this really big clash of traditionalists that don't like change and want to keep things the way they are, and maybe modernists who are trying to, you know, keep moving things forward and keep having, uh, keeping having progress. Um, there's some things we should talk about religion in the 20s. Uh, you know, one of the big things was um, the Butler Act. 
made it illegal to teach evolution. Again, traditionalist values saying, no, you can't teach evolution because evolution was a kind of new thing at the time. Uh, John Scopes was a science teacher. He taught evolution on uh, purpose to violate the law. And then he was eventually found guilty and fined for teaching it. Um, so that's kind of a famous individual in case. But again, showing kind of the struggle between modernists, like something like evolution, and then traditionalists who say like, you know, everything in the Bible is the reason why we're here, right? So now let's kind of shift away from like prohibition and kind of traditional values at the time battling with modernist values. And let's talk about uh, the Harlem Renaissance. I've shown you this before of kind of like migrational patterns of black Americans, but by the 1930, so at the end of the 20s, about 20% 20 of all uh, African Americans lived in the North. And uh, during World War I years, over a million moved North. This was known as the Great uh, Migration. Uh, the largest African American community developed in Harlem, which is up in New York City. Um, and it gave birth to the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance uh, was an explosion of music, acting, writing, and other forms of, of art in Harlem. And this art was primarily almost entirely uh, created, supported uh, by Black artists and by Black culture. Um, some of the most famous individuals include Langston Hughes, Zora Neale, uh, and Zora Neale Hurston uh, was a famous female member of the Harlem Renaissance. You had jazz musicians like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. Um, and so over time, and really for the first time in all of American history, uh, uh, African-American artists uh, gain popularity and recognition for the quality of their work. And in some ways, especially more really in the North, um, you know, they would actually, you know, perform for, you know, white people would go and to go see them and, and they would go perform. And it was a huge thing um, at the time. This is just kind of depicting, uh, you know, kind of an art piece of what would have been at the time of the Harlem Renaissance. And this is again where I'd show you videos of stuff, but we just don't really have the time for that with the pandemic. Um, Langston Hughes, just so you know, very famous poet during this time period. And he was really into talking about, you know, understanding a racial consciousness, uh, being proud of being black and really just promoting black culture. So Langston Hughes, again, in class, we'd normally read some of his stuff. The pandemic just hasn't given us the time to do that. Um, there are also some movements that are kind of birthed out and are partially supported by the Harlem Renaissance. We, uh, one big one that we'll talk about is Pan-Africanism. This was not just an American ideal, but it's kind of the worldwide intellectual movement uh, that aims to really encourage and strengthen bonds of solidarity between all people of African descent. So African people in South America, in Europe, back in Africa or anywhere else. These are kind of the symbols that you would have seen. One of the big guys um, in big influential leaders of, uh, in, of, of, in, of black leaders at the time. Uh, his name is Marcus Garvey. He was a Jamaican immigrant who came to America and he called for Negro nationalism, uh, that African immigrants and African-Americans, citizens, they should stand up for themselves. Um, they founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, uh, that pretty much argued that anyone of African descent should go back to Africa. This is kind of one of their big arguments. That's Marcus Garvey right there. Um, and over time, they started gaining members and they really started working uh, to help, you know, black people gain more political and economic power. Um, and by the start of 2020, or sorry, 1920, they had about 2 million members. Um, and, you know, there had big marches. Uh, there was like a 50,000 person march through Harlem. So a pretty significant amount of people. But uh, unfortunately, Garvey kind of made some huge mistakes. Um, there was one big instance where he went to a conference in 1922 with the leader of the KKK, kind of wild. Uh, and he was convicted of mail fraud by sending letters selling stock shares in a ship business called the Black Star Line. And the Black Star Line was going to be a cruise line to bring Africans from around the world back to Africa. Over time, kind of with these mistakes, uh, the UNIA collapsed and Garvey's mission of, of 
sending um, African, uh, African American or kind of the African diaspora from around the world, people around the world of African descent, to them back to Africa, it was never, never materialized. There's another important figure who was diametrically opposed to kind of what Garvey was about. Um, and this was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. And he is uh, about the NAACP. You might have heard about that before. Um, and he really despised Garvey. He was kind of bothered by Garvey meeting with the KKK and wanting to form an African society outside from America. You know, he saw this as Garvey admitting that blacks would never be equal to whites. Um, Garvey called, you know, Dubois a white man, you know what, due to his lighter skin color, uh, that kind of plays on the colorism aspects that, that, uh, so that exist in the black community. And really thought that Dubois despised Garvey for his darker skin. So there, there was a lot of this infighting, even though kind of both people wanted to achieve more support and more growth, and more power for their people, but they went about it in different ways. Um, and again, I say there, this is an example of colorism, and this doesn't just exist in the black community, um, but it's about the idea that skin tone, the, the, the skin tone, the color of your skin, it has different meanings, right? Um, but regardless, the lasting impact of all of this, uh, is pretty resounding and powerful. Um, I mean, all, this stuff influenced so much from Bob Marley, um, the creation of countries like Ghana, Liberia, um, foundational stuff of like Malcolm X. I mean, pretty much hip hop in all way has really been influenced in some way by the Harlem Renaissance. And again, in class, we show a lot of videos, we play like music and I show you all these things. We just, it's kind of, can't really do that right now with the, with the pandemic. And I wanna keep this video as streamlined as possible. There's actually too, a lot of uh, interesting correlations between the persecution of jazz as well as the persecution of hip hop. Uh, during the 1920s, jazz faced great persecution from the traditionalists, the KKK, temperance group, groups, excuse me, and others. And they said, oh, it's going to be the downfall of society, society, you know, but was it really about the music or was it really about who was producing the music and what did it stood, stand for, right? And, you know, the jazz is rooted in black culture made by black artists. Same thing, uh, you know, if we trace hip hop's roots, hip hop's earliest roots derived from uh, jazz um, here in America. And when hip hop first really started gaining mainstream popularity in the late eighties and then nineties, people saw it as vulgar, distasteful and a threat to America. Again, I'd show you this video in class of the interview of like Gerardo Rivera saying hip hop has done so much damage to the black community. Um, you should watch it though, if you want to, if you have the time for it. Here's some different songs. I've included a bunch of different links that you could listen to um, songs that, uh, really kind of spoke out, have spoken out about how like hip hop is persecuted in a certain way. Uh, some of these songs refer to like Marcus Garvey. Uh, some of these songs are kind of protest songs. Um, they relate to jazz. I'd probably play you some of these songs, but again, just not in class. And that's where we're gonna finish up here, y'all. Um, so make sure you uh, complete the homework assignment. And if you have any questions for me along the way, just shoot them my way. But besides that, uh, I will talk to you guys later and uh, have a good one.